Day 20, Adjustable Current Sink, aka a power supply dummy load. As promised back in uh, in day one, I said I'd uh, show you a simple design for uh, testing power supplies. Yeah, most of the time you test a power supply, most people will just grab a resistor like this chunky thing here and uh, plonk it across the output and measure the you know, currents and voltages, etc. That's all fine, but it's fixed, it's not adjustable, um, it's expensive and uh, single purpose, you know, if you, you for specific currents you have to have a different resistor for each current you and each power, each voltage you want, so that's uh, it's not a very not a very tenable solution, it certainly works and um, for some particularly large power supplies it may actually be your only hope, in, you know, to the point where you get a uh, big chunk of wire, nitrogram wire, and wind yourself like a heater or something and use that as a, uh, as a dummy load, but there are alternatives, you can, you can use common off-the-shelf transistors um, this is a pretty ancient transistor, this is a uh, 2N3055 which has a terrible beta but it's just about unkillable um, TO3 package so you can bolt it down to a massive heatsink and um, dissipate a heck of a lot of power so essentially you can act as an adjustable resistor more importantly it's not particularly difficult to set them up as a constant current source so no matter what the voltage um, on the power supply, as the voltage varies on the power supply It'll always pull the same amount of current, which is quite useful uh, if you're testing, you know, a power supply or doing a burn-in test or something. You can just leave it running. Alrighty, this is uh, this is the, the circuit of how you do it. Uh, there's a fuse here in reverse uh, polarity protection diode, not strictly required, but if you're going to build this, you might as well add them. Um, you can set up the uh, fuse to have a little bit more, say 150% of the maximum collector current of your uh, device. Just about any power NPN will work. Um, MOSFETs also work, but you have, the circuit has to be slightly different. BJTs have certain disadvantages, namely their temperature coefficient. They all uh, tend to drift up in current as they warm up, which is a little annoying. So you must put a resistor in their emitter, and this is also how you set up the constant, um, constant current. So essentially Ignoring the temperature stuff for a minute, the uh, the base emitter drop of a of a transistor is more or less you know a constant voltage. So whatever voltage you put on the base, you'll get a little bit less than that on the emitter. Normally about 0 0.6, 0 0.657 volts. Depends on temperature and current, and that you know is basically fixed by the base bias. So as you, as you move the voltage up, the emitter comes up with it. You move the voltage down, the emitter drops down. So if you put a resistance in the emitter circuit, whatever voltage you set across that resistor sets the current that will be pulled through the collector. Well, there's a bit of base current as well, but as long as the transistor's beta is reasonable, they, um, the emitter current and the base current are very, very similar. There's actually beta, was it beta plus one difference? Anyway, the, um, so the base current can be negligible as long as the transistor's going to say 100 or more, which might actually be a problem for, say, the old 2N3055. It's got a pathetic beta, particularly at high currents, but what you can do to get around that, because you know, your, your circuit has to be able to provide that base current. So to provide that base current, using a 9 volt battery wouldn't be terribly practical, but you can do a uh, Darlington pair where you've got an extra transistor which can be a fairly small one, um, say you know, a BD class transistor or maybe even a 2N3904 if you're building this for only a few amps and your transistor's got reasonable gain. So you have to pick this transistor to, be, to have sufficient collector current rating to provide the base current for this transistor that you're going to need to pull you know, the, the total amount of current that you're interested in for your uh, for your dummy load. So the particular transistor I've used here is a, I think it's an MJE series, I uh, just happen to have a bag of them lying around, that's why I use them, no other reason. I think they're uh, MJ1307, 8 amps, 800 watts, 400 volt. Uh, so they're a yeah, pretty big device. They're not as big. You can certainly get bigger ones and you can get much bigger and cheaper MOSFETs. MOSFETs are actually a better bet in some ways because you can get them cheap and huge and unkillable. Well, nothing's unkillable, but reasonably unkillable. Anyway, um, base the voltage divider here just sets the base voltage. There's a resistor here to limit the current when you turn it all the way up to something that's not going to destroy the transistor's uh, base emitter junction. And this resistor has to be suitably rated as well. The emitter resistor takes all of the current through it, so it has to be you know, a fairly large resistor. 
and make them up out of parallel resistors which is what I've done here on the practical circuit as you can see I've just got a whole bunch of 12 ohm resistors that I happen to have in the junk box so I hook 10 of them up so that gives me a 1.2 ohm resistor and uh, they're 1 watt devices so that's you know a 10 watt resistor basically this heatsink is woefully inadequate but unfortunately it's the only uh, heatsink that I could find I think my larger heat sinks are out in a box out in the attic and I'm not going to climb out there tonight and make a racket and wake everyone up. Um, yeah, pot here, There's, uh, as I've drawn on the diagram you should put a switch in here so you can turn it on and off conveniently. Um, the pot, obviously the larger it is the less current it pulls from your battery. This pulls about a milliamp I think so it won't last terribly long. What you can do is you can, as we've drawn down here, run the entire circuit, that would be a, a, um, a Darlington or MOSFET, whatever. Um, you can set its base voltage from the, the supply voltage that you're actually loading. However, if you do this, you're at the mercy of this voltage. So this voltage drifts, then the base voltage will drift and your current drifts. So what you might want to do is you can either add a Zener stabilizer supply for, to su stabilize the supply to the pot, and control, you know, fix the set point. It could be as simple as two LEDs even, maybe, which might be convenient too, because the thing will let light up when you've got it plugged in, you know when it's on. Um, yeah, in fact, if, it, if it's a low enough current, and you, or you, this resistor is fairly small, but don't make this resistor too small, or stability will suffer, and uh, various other problems. I'll talk about this more in detail when I write up the project, about all of the little subtle gotchas and stuff, but generally it's a pretty simple circuit to get going. Um, in any case, yeah, stabilize the, the voltage. The, you know, the battery isn't exactly stable either, but it's long-term much more probably stable than an experimental power supply you might be loading down. Or maybe not, I don't know. In any case, it's pretty simple to set up. The, with the MOSFET, this works particularly well. You can use like a 100k or one meg pot, and uh, you know, there's, there's no base current into a MOSFET, so it lasts practically forever. Good thing about MOSFETs is they have a uh, positive temperature coefficient in general. Uh, you know, the more current the thing pulls, the warmer it gets, so the less current it will pull, which is a good thing. And you, you can actually use the MOSFET channel itself as the resistor up to a point. But it's nice to have the feedback in the emitter, or in the case for MOSFET in the source, because it will, um, you know, stabilize the current. Although, I'll show you in a minute this circuit operating, you can watch it drift as it warms up a little bit. But you can, you can generally ignore that if it's a small enough, but if you've got, if you're doing this at, tens or hundreds of amps you probably want to be very careful about how you build it for obvious reasons. Again Ohm's law is your friend it's really all you need to dimension the components um, obviously the maximum ratings of all the devices have to be considered and the, the power dissipation you also have to do the thermals on the device so you have to consider the device to its heatsink and the size of the heatsink etc. Um, there's quite a lot of videos on the net already about how to do that I'll talk about it a bit in the write-up not rocket science, it's again, it's basically Ohm's law, but instead of using voltages and currents, you're using, you know, heat capacity, heat, um, and, yeah, I'll talk about it in detail, it's not particularly difficult. Alrighty, um, this is something you can do for to help with the BJT temperature stability problem, you can put a diode, just a normal silicon diode, and you can physically bond it to the heated, um, you know, transistor, to the, the heat sink, and preferably right over the device if you can. So when they're bound together, the, um, as it warms up, it'll warm up the diode, and the diode's drop will, will change, and if their physics is fairly matched, they should track reasonably well, certainly a lot better than not having it at all. There's some debate about whether you should use one or two if you're using a, uh, a Darlington. I'll, uh, I'll leave that up to an exercise for the reader, but uh, no, I won't tell you the answer. You can work it out. <laughs> you can actually try it and experiment. Um, MOSFETs are possibly a better deal nowadays. MOSFETs are, you know, you can obviously get massive, essentially bond wire limited MOSFETs that are uh, almost unkillable. And um, they've got the right temperature coefficient for stability and they're cheap as chips. So you might want to use them rather than BJTs. But BJTs are also often coming up in junk sales. You know, the 2N3055, you'll find it everywhere because it's cheap. And uh, there must have been a, a heck of a lot of them built at one point. So, also, you probably find some, uh, you know, heat sinks you can pull apart an old power supply, or it really just has to be a big enough piece of metal. But if you if you buy a brand new heat sink, you'll get all the thermal data with it, and that can help you, you know, work out that you so you won't be blowing up your load. This thing's quite scalable. You know, you can scale it up. You can parallel up transistors if you need to. 
so you could build you know multiple kilowatt loads if you really wanted to this particular load here you know well with the heatsink it's got at the moment it's not rated very highly but it, it can take probably 40 or 50 watts the device is rated to 80 watts with a suitable heatsink so it's uh it's reasonable for testing the power supply in, in the um, in day one because that was not capable of delivering that kind of power. It was only capable of 10 or 15 watts, I think, when I designed it. Anyway, uh, alright, real quick one. We'll show you it actually in operation. Okay, so as you can see here, this is uh, on the 10 ohm, uh, 10 ampere range. I'll turn up the load. See on my power supply the ampage going up and down as I turn the uh, turn the pot here. So I won't put it much over 200 milliamps because that'll fry the, the transistor slowly because it doesn't have a heatsink, or well, doesn't have a good heatsink. And that's actually, it's getting pretty warm. This resistor gets, you know, not very warm at all because it's ridiculously over specced and actually the gate current might be pushing this poor little 2N3904 uh, a little bit hard, but you know, it's just lukewarm. Anyway, again, do the math and be confident that you're not going to kill anything. Oh, you know, you can always overbuild. It's a simple, cheap piece of test equipment, so just double or triple or ten times the ratings on devices if you can afford it or if you need to feel confident about it. Obviously, this part of the circuit pulls virtually no current and is not a not a big issue. I put a resistor in here in the base of the um, the bottom half of the, the voltage divider of the, of the pot so that the pot actually... Um, yeah, it's very close to turning on at the very bottom of the, the threshold because it's obviously 1.2-ish volts across the two base emitter drops and when there's no current being pulled so you need to exceed that before the, the two transistors will turn on. Alrighty, so if I dial this up to say 200 milliamp-ish kind of region and then I fiddle with the power supply voltage so if I flick this over to voltage you can see even if I dial it all the way down to 3 volts, you can see it's holding 200 milliamps. When I ramp it up, there's a little bit of variation. Those of you who know about uh, semiconductor physics will know why. Again, that's an exercise for the reader, but uh, it's not particularly important. One thing that is also happening though is that it's warming up. Because the, the collector emitter voltage on the transistor is obviously basically the entire power supply voltage minus the little bit that's dropped over this. Uh, well, it's about 180, well, 180 millivolts in this case. So, um, as that voltage varies, various different things vary, but well, most importantly, the, the dissipation. So that heat sink's getting very hot at the moment. You can see it's drifted up 400 milliamps, which I can turn down and it will establish a new equilibrium. This is why temperature compensation is useful if you're going to build this. But it's not particularly critical. If you only, you know, want to hit hundreds of milliamps approximately for testing a power supply then it's not a big deal yeah new equilibrium so I can turn it down again obviously the situation gets worse with the more uh, the more dissipation the more heat being generated in the device all right enough of that I'm pushing that poor little device without a heatsink quite hard and it's uh, I can start to smell it because it's getting pretty darn hot. Alrighty, this is a quick and simple one. That's really all there is to it. I might, uh, I do have a one that I built many years ago, but I can't find it tonight. It's a big deluxe version using a huge MOSFET, 180 amp MOSFET. And one thing I added to it, which you might consider adding, is I, uh, I used this resistor as a shunt, or part of a shunt resistor, for a current meter. So I have a uh, yeah, off here I've got a current meter that, so it's actually a, you know, it's a voltage meter obviously with an appropriate shunt resistor but it's uh, it's set up such that the you know as you you can don't even need a multimeter or anything in series here you can just adjust this and read the current directly again it, you know, it's a moving coil meter it's a ball parking instrument but that's generally good enough for testing power supplies alrighty that's funny I said this was going to be a quick one and look it's almost 15 minutes here Listen to me talk about a uh, two transistor circuit for 15 minutes. Alrighty, um, tomorrow, hmm, don't have a whole lot of days left, so uh, some of those more non trivial ones are probably going to start coming up now. We'll see how we go anyway. Um, 
being around Christmas, it's getting uh, interesting finding the time between work and uh, all the other things that are associated with the Christmas season. But uh, I'm sure we'll come up with a few more circuits for you before uh, Christmas Eve. Alrighty, good night.